to another incredible story vamp storytelling showcase streaming through the powers of technology and the interweb straight to you. You can't stop the streams. I'm Justin Huddle, I'm the executive director of Sosie We All. This is Jennifer Corley, program director. Hi everybody. You know we, what? Neo Wise is gone from the sky, but the stars are all here tonight. Wise words, enjoy, just from us to you. Uh, we are streaming through the space satellites back down to your TV from a super secret location somewhere in the outer dregs of San Diego. Uh, but we're being very safe, very COVID savvy. You can't see it right now because we don't have enough cameras to show you, but everybody is very much spaced apart, very excited and ready to bring you a vamp uh, that's almost as good as if we could reach out and touch your face, but we can't right now. So a few things we just want to talk about and get across to you before we forget them all. Uh, we have a deadline for our next VAMP storytelling showcase, which is Plan B. The deadline for that is midnight, Sunday, August 2nd. Of course, you can go to our website, so say we all online.com and click on submit to do that. Also, we are still producing Long Story Short in Zoom format. You can participate if you go to the website, see the event, and uh, find the Zoom link there. But if you want to watch, we will also be streaming to Facebook Live, same place you're seeing us right now. And of course, the last bit of technology, uh, sorry, uh, checklist to get across is because we've spent so much money on technology while also losing so much money because plague. Uh, we need your help more than ever. So if you would want to hop over to our website, click on membership, we love you to death, and we are working up some very special member benefits just for you. Sound good? That's so anything? say we all online .com. Click on become a member or donate and you will find all the info you need. All right, you guys ready for a VAMP Storytelling Showcase? You guys ready for a VAMP Storytelling Showcase? Yes, they are. They're hot out the gate like a bull in Pamplona. Welcome our first performer, Elaine Gingery. My first lesson in storytelling happened when I was five. I tried to take my new roller skates out for a spin that afternoon, but I made a rookie mistake. What's this? My dad asked taking hold of my knee and twisting it this way and that, inspecting the sharp wound that my mom had cleaned earlier in the day. I fell off the porch. I thought about working myself up into a good cry, seeing if I could manage some sympathy from my dad, his rough hands still etched with grease after a day working in his auto repair shop. You have fell off the porch, that's it, that's the whole story? He looked disappointed and moved to get up and go into the house. Well, no, I was trying my new skates. His attention snapped back towards me. Wait, that's already better, the story. Okay, so tell me what happened. He grinned big and looked me full in the face, waiting. Well, I wanted to try out my new skates, so I sat down and... Where? Where? I echoed. Where were you sitting? Describe it. I was sitting at the top of the stairs on the porch, right at, right at the top, with my feet on the middle step, the skates next to me. Okay, he nodded. Then what? Well, I got the skates on, and I tied them tight like you showed me, and then I wanted to get off the porch, but I didn't really know how because I don't know how to skate yet, so I stood up, yeah, and I tried to walk down the steps, but I fell. More detail. How did you fall? Well, I tried to take a step forward, and the skates went all flippity-flop, and my feet went this way, and the rest of me went that way, and then I was on the ground and on my hands and knees, and it hurt. What kind of pain? Was it dull and thick, like when you get punched by your brother, or was it quick and sharp? Oh, quick and sharp, right, right in my knee, and I yelled out, yeah. Yeah, and I started to cry, and then I had to crawl back to the porch and yell for Mom, and there was blood all over my leg. You were crying so hard. I was crying, and there was snot coming out of my nose, and I was howling. His eyes went wide as he echoed, howling, howling, and crying. And Mommy had to clean me up and put on a bed, and you know what the worst part is? No, he cried. What is the worst part? I didn't get to try my new skates. I had to give up. I had to go inside and cry more and eat popsicles. Oh my gosh. That is such a great story. Yeah? Yeah, it's much better than I fell off the porch. He was nodding his head up and down and grinning from ear to ear and now so was I. I let out a huge he let out a huge sigh, smacked my other knee, the one with the red slash across it. Such a great story. He kissed my forehead as he stood up and went inside to clean up. 
I grew up on his storytelling. My dad was always ready for an audience to entertain. He's one of five kids who grew up in a very Catholic home in Pacific Beach. His dad was an engineer, and the why of a thing, the how does it work, was part of his upbringing. They fix things, the gangery boys, and if you listen to my dad's stories, they always did it with flair and chaos and often a trip to the ER. In a pack of kids like that, you had to find a way to stand out, and for my dad, it was with storytelling. He could take any simple event and spin it for you, growing and stretching the truth and details until you were caught up so deeply in his words that it didn't really matter how much truth and fiction diverged. But he, like his brothers, is deeply dyslexic and had been wrapped on the knuckles by the nuns at school for his inability to write a sentence without error after error littered throughout. He was more suited to be a mechanic than a poet, he would say. And so he opened his own auto repair shop in Miramar, telling his stories while standing across from enchanted customers, grease smudging his face and etching his hands. He smelled of that grease and the clean orange scent of Gojo and Justral Cleaner when he came home, even after he changed his stained clothing and dropped wearily onto the couch. I'd climb up onto his outstretched body, pancaking myself over him, ear to his chest, listening to the rise and fall of his breathing and the steady thump of his heart. He'd tell me a story, his voice rumbling through me as we lay stacked on the couch together, my body buzzing with his words. We'd grow quiet after a while, both of us drifting into a nap, my small form wedging itself deeper into the space between his supine body and the back of the couch, waking when mom roused us for dinner my face inscribed with the wrinkles of his shirt and the back of my legs etched with the corduroy pattern of the couch, my mind swimming with stories, his and mine. Years later, I'm on a road trip with my own family, husband, two kids, yellow lab. We've stopped for breakfast somewhere on the grapevine after an early morning start. We drive to Northern California a couple times a year to visit family there and have settled into the familiar rhythm of a 5 a.m. start time, getting us through L.A. before the morning rush hour makes it a slog. I cajoled my four-year-old Anya into a last-minute trip to the bathroom just in case she needed to pee before we got back into the car to continue north. We're heading back to the table, me at a leisurely pace, Anya at a skip, when I notice her accelerate towards the table, doing that little thing that kids do where their big heads kind of get out in front of them and you just know they're about to fall over. Her feet can't keep up and she flies face first towards the booth where her dad and big sister are sitting, smashing her face into the corner of the wooden bench seat. She's face down and howling, both of her hands covering her face. And I'm on the ground now too, scooping her into my lap and trying to get a look at the damage. There is so much blood sleeping, sleeping through her fingers, so much. And when I finally wrestle her hands away from her face, there's a small jagged gash next to her right eye. I let her cover it back up look at my husband and feel myself slip into the eerie calm of crisis. We are going to need some help. The waitress approaches and I ask for a bag of ice and clean towels. Is there an ER around here? My husband asks, his hands on my shoulders as I sit rocking our baby on the floor. Closest one's over an hour away, hon, she tells us, in Bakersfield. But there's a really good clinic up the road a bit. They open at 9 a.m., I look at my watch and see that we have a 30-minute wait. Do they do good stitches? I ask her. Oh, honey, I have five boys. I promise you, they do beautiful stitches. (laughs) So we drive up the road a bit, following the directions she's rattled off by memory, and wait in the clinic parking lot for 9 a.m. to roll around. Anya is on my lap, bloody face against my chest, her thumb firmly entrapped in her mouth. She's drifting in and out of sleep and sobs. She's calming now, and I'm breathing slowly and deliberately helping her regulate her own breath. I shut my eyes tight, feeling my calm shimmer before me, the urge to wail rising up like a panic. My baby is hurt. That's when I hear my dad's voice in my mind. Oh, this is going to be such a great story. My inner dialogue growls back at him, but my fear calms with his voice, and I kiss Anya's damp forehead, smoothing her wispy locks of curls while I clutch her to me, the bag of ice melting slowly in the space between her face and my chest. I hear my dad say, pay attention, kid. Knowing these would be his words if I had him on the phone right now, it's going to be such a great story later. And so I pay attention. I watch as they prepare to strap her down so they can give her the lidocaine shot. I feel my body tense as they insist that no child that little could hold still, and since the needle would be near her eye, they couldn't risk her moving. So I send my husband out of the room with our six-year-old, not wanting her to see what would look like an attack on her sister. And as the nurse advances on my baby, one of them croons, It only hurt a little bit, honey. 
and my body leaps up blocking them suddenly knowing that this is wrong you will not strap her down just give me a minute we don't lie to our kids not ever i take her sweet round face to my hands and i tell her they're gonna put the pain to sleep but it'll hurt for a minute when they do it like it'll hurt a lot you can scream as loud as you want you can squeeze my hands but you must not move or the hurt could make it so bad you can't see anymore can you hold still I promise the pain will stop if you can hold still she looks me straight in the eye and says okay mommy I can do it then she holds perfectly still while they put a scary big needle in her face I get as close as I can, encouraging her to scream out the pain as loud as need to, baby. And she wails while squeezing the hell out of my hands, but she does not move. I was so fucking proud of that kid. As they remove the needle, her scream slides backwards off of her, dropping to the floor as she starts to relax. Oh, mommy, the pain is going to sleep. The nurses are in awe, standing dumbfounded for a moment, then whisper to each other in the background. I hold Anya's gaze, stroking her hair and telling her that she did a great job. I hear the doctor utter a quiet, wow, and then re-engage, gently touching the area around Anya's eye and asking her if this part was asleep or that part there. There was no longer a need for the extra nurses in the room, but they stayed anyway, wanting to see what kind of magic we'd pull out of our hats next, busily bustling around the room, looking useful. By the time the doctor was nodding the last stitch, Anya was joking with the staff and amazed at how her owie was all sleepy now and didn't hurt anymore. My mom said it would go to sleep, and it did. Sure did, sweetie, replied the doctor, who then took me aside for follow-up instructions while the nurse bandaged Anya's wound. I've never seen that before, she told me at the end. We always have to hold them down. Well, yeah, if you lie and say it'll only hurt a little, and then it hurts a lot, you have no trust with the kid. You can't lie to them. The needle hurts. She looked sheepish for a moment and then pulled back on her professional face. We shook hands and I talk, took my daughter out to the car where her dad and sister had been waiting. We got back on the road and I told him what happened, how I had refused to let them hold her down and how amazingly she'd handled it. I could hear my dad's voice again, urging the story's details forward. Anya was giggling in the back with her sister and my body sank deeper into the seat of the car, the story over. My husband leaned towards me and quietly said, She's okay. You can cry now. The sucker punch of emotion bent me over for a moment, pulling against the still bloody seatbelt, and I quietly sobbed out the adrenaline, the fear, the relief washing over me in waves as he steadily drove north. Mommy! Anya's voice piped up from the back. Pain's waking up, but it's okay. Yeah, baby, what does it feel like? I asked, hearing my dad's words escape my own mouth like a legacy. Can you describe it? She scrunches up her nose and cocks her head to one side. It just feels funny, like sparkles in my face. I wipe my tears, my breath slowing down, and my body, body finally calm. <laughs> like sparkles? That's amazing. Tell me more. A couple, couple days after Anya's accident, and we're settled into my in-law's home, where my girls feed carrots to the horses, and their grandmother reads them books on demand, I finally get a moment to call my dad tucking the phone to my ear and watching my daughters as they sit together on the porch swing, legs dangling and voices giggling as twilight falls. The red slash cross on Anya's face is healing nicely, and she didn't make a single complaint about it today while playing in the snow we found on a drive up to the mountains. I've just finished telling my dad the story of what happened at the clinic when some, something occurs to me. You know what's messed up, Dad? What? He asks. You taught me to get excited about shitty things happening to me. I mean, when crap is going down, I actually look forward to telling the story of it later. He laughs out loud, the rumble of it vibrating through the phone and into my ear. And hey, he proclaims, you can totally call her Scarface now. You say that like it's a good thing. She is four. Yeah, but it's a really cool nickname, especially for a four-year-old, he insists. This from the guy who really wanted me to name her Wolfgang. Hey, Wolfgang is an excellent name. It's German. And then he rolls off into a story about his grandmother, who was German. Embellishments and half-truths flinging through the phone lines. Our history spilling out in front of me. Both of us alive with the telling of it. Okay, that was great. A wonderful story from Elaine Gingery. And next up, we have a veteran performer, Jennifer Coburn. And here she is telling her terrific story. 
I was riding a high fueled by pink cotton candy and the adrenaline rush from having just ridden a swinging car on Coney Island's Wonder Wheel, the cool breeze of the Atlantic Ocean brushing through my hair. Next to the Wonder Wheel was the Spookorama, and at eight years old I had been on this ride many times with my father, a groovy cat of the 1970s who wore his sideburns long and his long wavy brown hair even longer. My dad wrote Dylan-esque ballads about peace and freedom while passing a joint among friends. And he paid the bills through a variety of jobs, most of which were legal. He didn't love the spookorama because he thought that kids could use more love and less horror. But I enjoyed the ride, just him and I in a little teacup cart together. Bats flew so low over our heads that we could feel their rubbery wings slap against our foreheads. And then Dracula's coffin rose into an upright stand and popped out as the vampire asked, Who dares enter the Spookorama? Riding the Spookorama with my dad was easy. He laughed at the monsters and called them uptight. When our cart passed a thousand-year-old witch stirring a cauldron filled with the bodies of children, it reminded my dad that he was hungry for clam chowder. It was awesome. But when the doors of the Spookorama flew open and the bright lights of the real world um, came to in and the ride was over, I was not ready for the fun to end. Dad reminded me that Coney Island was a big place and that there was lots more to do and see. We could eat caramel popcorn, sample fudge, or he suggested we could just head down to the beach and feel each other's vibes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Daddy, I am eight years old. I do not have vibes. Then a brilliant idea. Why don't I ride the Spookorama by myself while you wait out here? All right, he said. You're old enough to make your own decisions about your life. I walked onto that ride with the swagger of a Top Gun pilot ready for my mission. I had the need for, if not speed, well, Spooky shit. Before the doors to the Spookorama closed behind me, I took one last look at my father, standing outside in the sunshine, unwrapping a piece of blue saltwater taffy from its wax paper. Then, the doors closed, and everything was pitch black. I had forgotten about the long corridor of darkness before the ride really got going. I shrieked when I heard those dis when I felt those disgusting bats touching my head. And Dracula? At the sight of him, I let out a blood-curdling scream. It was a scream you could hear from space. It was a scream that involved every part of my body. My toes stiffened and splayed. My neck looked like tree roots, and my lips tingled from being stretched so wide. Then I heard a loud thud and the screech of metal scraping against metal. My cart came to a halt and the witch stopped stirring at her cauldron, then froze and her head dropped, almost as though she was embarrassed. Before I could consider what was happening, bright lights switched on and the spook house transformed into what looked like an empty parking garage. There were wires coming from Frankenstein's hands Dracula was hooked up to some sort of power box, and the bats, they were like strips of cloth that you'd see in a car wash. Seconds later, I heard my father's voice calling my name in a panic. It was very loud and very clear. Did he just run into the spookorama? <laughs> Another man's voice followed, calling for him to stop. In a flash, my father was by my side, begging me to stay in the car. These things are on a rail. If you jump out of the cart, you could be electrocuted. A man in an oil-stained Captain Crunch t-shirt caught up to us. Are, are you fucking crazy, man? You can't just run into the Spookorama. You could get yourself killed. My dad explained that he was terrified that I'd get out of the cart. I I'm sorry, brother. You got kids? The ride operator sighed heavily and waved a hand. Pops do all kinds of crazy shit for our kids, don't we? And then miraculously, he hugged my father and told him to get into the cart. No, no more of this Captain America shit, huh? 
A girl needs her daddy around. It didn't seem like a good time to tell the fathers uh, bonded in their embrace that it had never occurred to me to get out of the cart. <laughs> I knew better than to mention this, and on some level, I knew that I shouldn't ever mention it. And really, what was the harm? What was, uh, what was wrong with maintaining a little lie that made my father feel so good about himself? Ten years later, he was diagnosed with lung cancer and told he had maybe six months to live. At about three months, he was a skeleton with a thin layer of pale skin draped over his bones. The cartilage of his jaw eroded and his bottom lip and chin slipped an inch to the side of his oversized skull. He looked like a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp clinging to his survival. His body was eroding, but his mind remained sharp as any other man in his 40s. He had strong opinions about the music of the 1980s, mostly that it was shit. <laughs> and he still uh, enjoyed fine food and good weed. And he still liked to tell stories. Dad lamented that all anyone wanted to talk to him about anymore was his health. I'm like the all-cancer network. I want to talk about other things while I'm still here. Did I ever tell you that I was the captain of the Brooklyn College soccer team and I played the second half of a big game with a sock stuffed in my split lip? Sitting on the bench of his sister's blooming backyard, he continued, I scored the winning goal with a sock in my lip. Seeing my confusion, he explained, The game isn't over for me. I'm sick of all this cancer shit. Let's you and me... Let's just pretend this isn't happening. It was my turn to run into the dark for him, to show him that this world of horror that he had entered alone was just an illusion. It was a lie, but it felt like a gift for both of us. We could create a bubble, a private world where he was fine. It was our own teacup cart on a very different ride. In the fun house that my father created, the mirrors were distorted, but at least we could make plans for a future. For his birthday, my father asked me for a wristwatch. He didn't even accept that his pain medication was for the cancer. Instead, he invited some of his junkie friends over and partied on hospital-grade end-of-life drugs. <laughs> At his funeral, I comforted neighbors from his apartment building devoid of any feeling. His friends cried and his family tied black bands of cloth around their sleeve. I comforted them with trite consolations about him being in a better place and his memory being a blessing. One person mistook me as an employee of the funeral home rather than the daughter of the deceased. I knew I should have felt grief, but I couldn't. It wasn't that I was fighting it back, I just didn't feel anything. I had cauterized the artery that could experience his loss, and I had no idea how to undo it. I wasn't even sure I wanted to. In our world, loving someone meant bending reality to protect them, sometimes even convincing yourself of a better truth. It was voluntarily gaslighting yourself just a bit and pretending that, yeah, I was going to jump out of the Spookorama cart. You saved my life. And no, you don't have cancer. You're not going to die. Everything's fine. Acknowledging that everything wasn't fine would be a betrayal. I was supposed to keep running down a soccer field with a sock in my lip. Not only that, I had to score a winning goal that way. It took five years before I cried over my father's death when a boyfriend told me that he loved hearing stories about my dad and he couldn't wait to meet him. I couldn't imagine why this nice guy was being such an asshole. I mean, why would he say such a, ca a callous thing? When I reminded him that my dad had died five years ago, he was shocked. He swore I had never told him. With the sincere conviction of somebody who is absolutely telling the truth, my boyfriend said that I talk about my, boy, my father in the present tense, so he assumed my dad was alive and well. No, he's not. My father is dead. 
To this day, I don't know if the tears that followed were from the grief of saying those words or the pain of never having spoken them before. I suppose it doesn't matter. But a new reality set in, and my world shifted. There are all kinds of palliative care. They, call, they all cost something, whether it's a hospital bill or an emotional toll. For my dad, it was running into the dark, the first time willingly, the second time out of desperation. For me, it was jumping into the cart with him, both lovingly and selfishly. Neither of us wanted to be on this scary ride at all, much less alone. So we clung to each other's willingness to comfort one another, to anesthetize ourselves from reality. For better and for worse, we finished that ride together. Thanks. The illustrious Jennifer Coburn, everybody give it up for her. Next up, we have a man, a friend of mine who's been with Sociate We All since the very beginning, and uh, I celebrate his mellowness through fatherhood. Please welcome our friend, Dallas McLaughlin, everybody. <coughs> oh, sure. <clears throat> fucking fuck! Fuck that fucking kid! This is what I heard as Jason kicked open the door to the green room, raced past me in a fury, and threw his sailor hat into his locker before kicking the locker door shut. Bad show, I asked. Fuck you, Jason replied, kicking the locker again, and this time putting a dent in it. He then hastily fixed a smudge of makeup on his face, grabbed his sailor hat out of his broken locker, and headed backstage for his next cue. Jason and I were both mimes. <laughs> Mimes at SeaWorld's Sea Lion and Otter Show. Jason had only been at the show for about a month and had finally had one too many run-ins with shitty kids. And unfortunately, kids were pretty much the worst part of the job. If you've ever been to SeaWorld and seen the Sea Lion and Otter Show, then you've probably seen the guy who comes out into the crowd before the show starts and messes with everybody. Most people know them as Biffs, and for most people, it's their favorite part of the show. I was a Biff. I was your favorite part of the show. <laughs> Jason had only been doing the pre-show for about three months. He was a very physically gifted performer, quick, agile, strong. He wasn't a funny person, but he could sell the bits with his body. He was very similar to the guy who trained me to do the part back in 1999. Back then, the show had an island theme, and the pre-show performer wasn't a mime or a biff. We were called Juan Ho. I was hired after my audition where I did an impression of a roly-poly doing an impression of Shamu. I was 19, I came up with the idea in the parking lot before the audition, and it killed. The guy who trained me was one of the best pre-show performers there ever was. He was quick and wacky and agile, and he picked up immediately that I was none of those things. I was Buster Keaton to his Charlie Chaplin, the deadpan goof who could take a fall that looked so real it probably was. He once told me in rehearsal, you have an incredible gift that I don't have. You can make 2,500 people laugh just by raising your eyebrows. He was right. <laughs> Summers at Sea Lion and Otter were the best back in those days, before Blackfish and the brigade of misinformed minivan moms. We would do six shows a day, and every show would be filled to capacity. In a day, we'd perform to about 12,000 people. That's some kind of eyebrow power. We had an incredible stable of bits already put together through the years, like the one, two, three magic trick. <laughs> We did a bit called Kid in the Moat, where you desperately tried to convince a little kid to jump in the moat. Build a family, where you grab someone's camera from the crowd, bring them up, and start gra grabbing random people from all over the stadium to be in their family photo. If you set up a white couple with a black kid, it always got a good laugh. If you put a black and a white parent with an Asian kid, utter pandemonium. <laughs> The options were almost endless, and sometimes some of us would spend our entire 15-minute pre-show just doing the build-a-family bit. 
My favorite was always the blindfold. This is where you pick a guy from the audience. It had to be a guy. The audience didn't like it when you did this to a girl. You'd have him stand in the middle of the walkway against the glass. You'd tie a bandana around his eyes like a blindfold, raise his arms in the air, and then walk slowly away. Then you lean against the wall and do nothing. Then you leave the stadium. The guy just stands there like an idiot. It's great. For years, we had the freedom to try new things, improvise, develop new bits, and it was probably the most fun I ever had on stage. But now, a decade later, my legendary eyebrows were covered in white, and I squinted through show after show, reapplying my makeup every hour. The show switched themes to a submarine, and we weren't biffs, we weren't one hose, we were mimes, and it sucked. Like, really sucked. <laughs> None of us were trained mimes. We didn't know how to mime, and none of the jokes or bits we did were mime-esque. We never pulled on a fake rope or got trapped in a fucking box or rode an imaginary horse or whatever it is that mimes do. I don't know because I never was one. I was just a chubby comedian who could take a fall, and now all of a sudden someone said, put white on your face. Literally, for this mime year, nothing changed in the pre-show except now we had white face on. They were even fine if we talked. It made no sense. <laughs> But it did piss off kids. Holy shit, do kids hate mimes. And let's be fair, everyone hates mimes. You've never walked into a room and seen a mime and were like, hell yeah. Your first reaction was to hurt the mime. And the kids did. They would punch us, kick us, pour water on us, throw food at us. The few first few times a kid kicks you in the knee, you just try to play it off and ignore it because what a little shit, right? Their parents never cared, and most of the time, they just laughed harder at that than anything else. The fifth time you get kicked, you learn to fight back. Like, I would take off my hat, dip it into the moat, fill it with water, and dump it on the child's head. The violence was never going to stop, so you developed ways to defend yourself that looked like it was a bit. As long as it looked like it was part of the show, no one questioned it. Dumping water on kids' heads, heads was never officially sanctioned by SeaWorld, but the mimes adopted it quickly. If a kid walked up and smacked us, we'd steal their popcorn and give it to another person, or just dump it out. If they yelled something at us, we would grab them by the sleeve and walk them out of the stadium and then latch the door shut. The back and forth was a staple of the show, but you had to really hate the kids to make it work. We became mimes because we had a new head of entertainment. He was an idiot. His only experience in entertainment was that he played trumpet. He had worked... <laughs> He had worked his way up through the ranks at SeaWorld San Antonio, and they thought that maybe, just maybe, he could come in and give a jolt to some of the shows. Spoiler alert, he did the opposite. He was a short man who demanded that his word was final and cared very little for what anyone else thought. You know, the best temperament for creative group endeavors. His terrible leadership was one thing, but his ideas were bad. I mean, hell, we were mimes all of a sudden. And after a few months of being mimes, lockers being dented, kids beating us while parents laughed, we decided it was time to revolt. Quietly, obviously. <laughs> it began simply enough. We tried to do actual mime routines. Pulling the rope, the box, whatever. It didn't matter because we were bad at them and real mime bits aren't funny. We stopped using the bandana altogether in favor of an imaginary one. The one, two, three magic trick and blindfold bits did not work as well. When we all when we all got written up for decide when we all got written up for deciding as a group that we shouldn't wear white face, we should in fact wear no makeup. It was decided that a member of leadership would be out there to watch every show. Naturally, we took it further. <laughs> Instead of no makeup, we put white circles around our noses or mouths. One mime just did white makeup on his neck. <laughs> I started to add facial hair to my makeup. More write-ups, and none of us cared. Mainly because they couldn't fire all of us, but they did fire Jason because he ended up kicking a kid. <laughs> we pressed on and began the greatest stretch of shows that were ever done in the history of Sea Lion. We called them the Dare Shows. In our dressing room, there is a whiteboard, and it was your job to write out a dare for the mime in the next show. Whatever that dare was, you had to do it, because we would stay after our shifts and watch to make sure. For example, for the entire show, you have to keep fake crying. For the entire show, you have to act like you're having light stomach pain. For the entire show, you have to wear a woman's bikini top and never make reference to it. 
<laughs> mouth curse words when asking the audience to applaud volunteers. <laughs> Sit up the stairs to the moat and mime fishing for 15 minutes. My two favorite dares came near the end. I dared one of the mimes that for the entire show, they had to start a bit and then halfway through, give up on it. No payoff, no reference, just give up and move on. It was perhaps the hardest I and the sound man have ever laughed. The other was when I was dared when I was dared during a completely packed house to walk to the very top of the stadium and walk down to the bottom by going through each and every row acting like I was looking for a seat. By the time I got to the bottom the show had started. By the time I got to the office I was told to go see our new head of entertainment. I walked into his office and he informed me that he would be imposing a new rule at Sea Lion. We would all have to do the same exact pre-show. No changes, no improv, no going with the flow. From start to finish, there would be a set script and we'd all have to follow it or we'd be asked to leave the company. He's seen the dare board and he wasn't having it. I said I looked forward to seeing a script that he wrote and I left. Two days later, I saw the script. Lots of typos. <laughs> what he didn't understand was that I, as you can tell, am long-winded. I also don't appreciate people who don't know how to do what I do telling me how to do it. So I sat down and wrote a three-page email to every person in leadership in my department and in the animal training department as well, explaining why this idea of making us all do the same pre-show wasn't only a bad idea, that it was also impossible. You don't have the same crowd 15 minutes before the show on a Tuesday in February as you might on July 3rd. If there was no one in the crowd, you couldn't do build a family unless you were trying to build my family, which was just me and my mom. No one would laugh at that unless you were my dad. <laughs> I had several examples, well thought out points, in a history only a decade of doing the show could bring. The next afternoon, I was told the head of entertainment wanted me in his office before the nighttime sea lion show. We weren't mimes in the night show, so I had less prep time and could stop in his office for a little chat. And all chats with him were little. That's a petty joke, I know. But I had just wiped <laughs> off a pound of white from my chaffed Irish face. I walked into his office, and sitting across from his desk were the three other bosses of entertainment, all under him, of course, but any one of these four people could have fired me immediately. They didn't. They sat. I sat. And that's when the head of our department, department cursed me out for the next 25 minutes. After the first profanity lay sentence, I looked back at the other three bosses, who all looked like they'd just seen a ghost. They clearly weren't expecting this and did not, like, look, did not look like they were enjoying it either. I had a notepad to take notes, but all I wrote was dick. <laughs> he continued to berate me in my simple opinions. He told me I wasn't half as good as I thought I was. He called me an asshole several times, even going so far as to say that I had fucked up his vision for the show by just being there. He ended by telling me that if I wanted to give him my opinion on shows again, I could come to his office, close the door, and say it to his face, because then we'd see what would happen. No one moved. No one said a word. Then he asked if I had any questions. I said, no, I have to go do a show now. I then stood up and pulled an imaginary rope to get out of the room. <laughs> I heard a giggle from one of the other bosses. I then went down to my cubicle and wrote an email to the head of HR about what had just happened. I CC'd everyone in the room on it except for the dick himself and pushed send. I then went out and did perhaps one of the greatest shows I had ever done. A couple weeks passed and I received a call from the head of HR. He wanted me to come in and he asked me about his well he wanted to ask me more about my email and have me come in and give an official statement. I was then called by the other three bosses who were in that room and told me they just gave a statement defending me. Apparently the dick had also written an email to HR claiming that I was the one who called him names and that I challenged him to a fight. He also assumed his underlings would have his back. But what he failed to understand was that he was a dick. <laughs> he had made every show worse within nine months and everyone hated him. After a few days, the punishments were handed down. I was suspended without pay for a week due to emailing all the people I did. My work email access was also revoked until further notice. The dick, on the other hand, got to keep his email access. However, he was never allowed to be alone in a meeting ever again. And if he was, the door to his office had to remain completely open. He was restricted from contacting me without approval from my immediate supervisor, and he was never allowed to receive a promotion within the company ever again. The other three bosses got me a thank you card and had everyone in the department sign it except him. <laughs> they presented it to me with a cake that said the witch is dead and gave me a standing ovation when I came in for my next shift after my suspension. 
A few months later, the dick went back to San Antonio, and we had a new head of entertainment who announced that at the end of the year we'd be changing the Sea Lion show entirely and would no longer be mimes. It was a small victory, but at this point, I was done. When auditions for the new show were announced, I didn't participate. I quietly bowed out after 11 years on the stage and with white makeup dripping from my sweaty face. I still hosted other shows in the park, including Pets Rule, Shamu's House of Douse, and some seasonal things, but I had no desire to go back to Sea Line. That is until 2012, when they had to fire one of the best for something and asked if I fill in for a couple of weeks. The show hadn't really changed at all, so I only, only needed a day of rehearsals. When the time came to hire a new Biff, they just asked me to stay on. I had just gotten married, and we could definitely use the extra cash, so I said yes. I instantly had more experience at the show than anyone else involved at that point, and they all knew the story, so I pretty much got to do whatever I wanted. The show did stay a bit more structured than in my original run, but overall, it was just like being 19 again. Except now, I was in my 30s and weighed over 250 pounds. I was pretty old for a biff, a physically demanding job that always required jumping and dancing on a concrete stage while being completely soaked almost the entire time. You ran up and down stairs for almost the entire pre-show, and now you didn't stop moving for about 40 minutes, as Biff's had a very prominent role in the actual show as well. After a few years and many nights of me coming home in tears because of terrible back pain, knee pain, or just general soreness, I had to finally call it quits. After 14 years, I had done the job longer than anyone ever had. I had done more pre-shows than anyone ever had, almost 9,000. I was tired. I was too old. But instead of accepting my resignation, they asked me to become the boss of the Biffs, to teach and train the newbies. So I did. Not before one last show. My goodbye show. In 2016, I walked from the top of the stadium to the bottom of the stadium, going row by row and tripping over people, spilling drinks and popcorn, never saying a word, until I got to the top of the stage and for one last time said bye. Oh my goodness, Dallas McLaughlin, everybody. Our next performer is pulling triple duty on tonight's show. He's been an amazing gift to all of us. Please welcome fan favorite, Jonathan Hammond, everybody. As a child, my parents owning a camper meant one thing. We drove from where we lived, which was nowhere, to somewhere else that was nowhere. And because the destination was uniformly a campground, it meant we were not going to one of my favorite places, which was Six Flags or my grandmother's condo on the beach. Those were special events. And 1981 had already seen not only a trip to both Six Flags and the beach, but we had visited the queen mother of all things luxurious, Disney World as well. So my big boy Mickey Mouse teacup hath runneth over, and I was happy to settle into the bliss that were the BLTs being served for dinner on a random picnic table in the middle of God knows what forest in the middle of some state that started with an I. <laughs> this was not a complaint, however, because I was in a camper, which is basically a small house that drove, a concept that was completely mind-blowing and endlessly exhilarating to the seven-year-old me. <clears throat> on very special trips, I got to eat s'mores, which was especially exciting given my mother's tightly wounded sugar aversion. My grandmother collected the mayonnaise smeared paper plates and shooed us away. It's a beautiful night. You need to get going, she said to me. Wait, we're in the middle of nowhere. Where are we going? I ask. I read they have a really nice playground here, my mother says, and then gives me a wink. I am so excited I can barely contain myself. My parents, both on each side of me, hold my hand as they escort me down the gravel road lined with statues of Yogi and Boo Boo. My father normally enjoys picking me up as we walk, swinging me around, putting me on his shoulders, whatever he has to do to engage my play. But tonight he is quiet, as is my mother. 1981 had been a chilly year. Several months earlier, while I was playing with my father's marbles under my father's desk in his office, I told him... I don't like being seven. I miss being six. He took my words very seriously. Why is that, son? Well, you and Mom give me headaches when you talk, and you give me headaches especially when you don't talk. He quietly nods, knowing knowing this is not a callous insult or brat speak, but genuine concern for my happiness. 
Being eight will be much better, he says. I want to believe him. We arrive at the playground. My mother looks at my father for an empty moment. Jack, you play with the kids while I sit, please. Her words linger between both a command and a newly inspired suggestion. All right, says my father, and he does as he is told. My mother sits on a bench and watches as my father swings my sister and I, holds us as we climb over this and that, undoubtedly is catching us here and there. My mother is madly in love with being a mother, and she can be as warm as the tungsten silhouette of her auburn hair. Her life's wish was to have three children who loved the Chicago Cubs with just an inch less fervor than they loved Jesus. She is kind but opinionated, loving but her moods could be unhinged at times, and she doesn't handle stress well. She was like Joe March, who never left for the big city, but rather just worried a lot and believed her lord and savior to be a socialist hippie who would re surely disapprove of Reagan. We are in the fade after magic hour, where you can still see clearly and the lightning bugs start to glow, but the crickets have yet to sing. I see my mother on the bench, and she is happy, serene. She is usually animated, excitable. This is unlike her. We play on the jingle gym for an exceptionally long period when my mother comes running over to us. She is suddenly back to her old self. There is a path over there. Growing up with the woods burning our backyard, this is nothing to be excited about. My father and I look and there is an unremarkable clearing in the trees. There are no signs. There are no signs. And as we know, and as we are now fully in the vastness of night, so there's no way of knowing where the path leads or how deep it is. I wonder where it goes. Let's go check it out, she says. Now, I want to be clear. <clears throat> my mother spent most of her free time worrying about my safety. I was what you call coddled. I grew up in a very isolated modern family subdivision, which was made up mostly entirely of cul-de-sacs. My mother did not allow me to ride my bi bike beyond my own cul-de-sac for fear of the remote possibility of being abducted by teenagers and forced to drink beer. <laughs> and or joining a satanic cult. I would be in my 30s before I, I could convince my mother to try Chinese food. So the whole off the beaten path thing, especially when it's dark, steep, and unmarked, really wouldn't be her go-to thought process. And me questioning my mother certainly would not be my go-to. But we do it. We descend into the path. It is very dark, but there was a single lantern hanging from the trees about 30 feet in. Somehow, this illumination makes the path slightly creepier. We nervously stand at the entrance for several moments, mesmerized. Do you hear that? My mother asks. Just crickets in the distance. Then S's and P's and T's. The faint sound of voices. Somewhere in the thick of the darkened forest. Inexplicably, my mother pulls us down into the darkened, serpentine semi-walkway, with occasional railroad tie as a step, towards the voices. This is weird. I am concerned. I cannot see my parents' faces. After what feels like five minutes of walking through the darkened brush, there is a clearing. It is a dock. We have arrived at a lake. Not a round lake, but one with twists and bends. It almost looks like a river, but it is still. The moon and its reflection in the ripples are the only illumination. I can see my parents' faces again. There are people standing on the dock. An elderly couple and another family. They gently, very slowly turn to look at us as if we're intruding. They just stare. And I, shy to strangers and deficient to world experience, can only stare back. Sensing that this may not be normal. My mother asks, What are y'all doing? They look at her for a moment, at us. The elderly woman forces a smile and says, We are waiting for the boat. Oh, okay, sounds good, says my mom, as if really saying, We also will wait for the boat, not quite reading the room. <laughs> and so we just stand there for probably ten minutes with the six other strangers on a dock, on a lake, at the end of a random, unmarked path waiting for a boat. The strangers occasionally whisper amongst themselves, occasionally look at us. We don't respond, we just wait on the fucking dock for a fucking mystery boat. <laughs> My mother looks at me and gives me a look of, that look of, isn't this great? <laughs> it is quiet on the dock and then a distant motor. It comes around the bend, a red ferry. Hello, says the captain with a jolliness that is somewhat forced. 
Would you five folks like to take a ride? Sure, shouts my mother with a gusto of a cheerleader. Everyone else in sync slowly turns to look at her. She pays them no mind, but we let the others enter first. The captain cranks the engine and we depart from the dock into the middle of the very dark lake. We move past the bends and the twists, come into a larger clearing resembling a standard lake, before entering other bends and twists. Excuse me. Everything around us is pitch black. Darkness for a good ten minutes except for the August Indiana sky. It is silent sands for the motor and the small waves the boat produces. My parents were the national amateur champions in doubles for tennis for several years in a row. One of the reasons they bought a camper was so that they could focus on more local tennis tournaments as they had a young family. Their, te their technique was like a slickly oiled psychic machine, knowing what the other would do several steps ahead. They also spoke this way, often finishing each other's sentences. But since I had turned seven, they had begun to lose. Not only had they stopped finishing each other's sentences, they stopped talking to one another. They stopped talking to me. There are several occasions, occasions in which both parents had forgotten to pick me up from school. But when I was six and before, I was their world. But now we are on a boat on a dark lake with six other people, probably body snatchers. <laughs> and then it happens. Possibly the biggest surprise of my life up to this point. The dark sky reflects something incandescent from below. There is light emitting from a hill on a bend. Behind the trees, there is something very bright. The teaser trailer from Close Encounters of the Third Kind comes to mind. But instead of a single road, it's an entire tree-covered hill. So more War of the Worlds, but less ominous, more wondrous. We begin to hear voices, a crowd of sorts. There are screams. Definite screams, but what is happening to them is such a familiar sound. How can there be your screams? We are literally in the middle of nowhere. We come around the bend and then assault of the senses. The sounds are defined by the images the sounds are as defined as the images that match. It is a roller coaster. It is a Ferris wheel. It has thousands of matching white lights in a perfect line. There in front of me, on this random lake. In the middle of nowhere is the skyline of an amusement park. I am in the middle of a goddamn real-life Ray Bradbury book. <laughs> I looked at my parents. Their plan worked. My dad laughs and my mother winks. They all knew along where the path led. We ride one, more, we ride one ride this particular evening. It is dark and getting ready to close. But the next day my grandparents, also part of the scheme, watched my baby sister so my mother and father could take me to the park. I remember my mother, fascinated with the ice in her, in her water, calling it the most beautiful ice she had ever seen, and wishing she could take it back with us to Decatur. I remember running to make the departing riverboat, and tripping on the dock, but keeping my ice cream level so as not to drop it, as I knew that would be the last time I would be allowed that much sugar for months. It was a perfect day, and I could seem to do no wrong. <clears throat> My parents' attention was laser-focused on me, so I was not going to pay any mind to the tension I was feeling between the two of them, which, in hindsight, I recognized was the elusive and undiagnosed source of my headaches. No, nope, no, nope, today it was easy to ignore the indefinable and nebulous unhappiness that had been plaguing my house since I had turned seven, because I savored basking in every moment that was the splendor of my parents' heat ray of love. I got to ride the rides, eat the ice cream, and I didn't have my baby sister around to steal my thunder. I wanted this day and its perfection to last forever, as cliché as that sounds. I distinctly remember thinking that, but, cl but clichés are generally true, especially the cliché, nothing lasts forever. The first thing my parents did was sell the camper to pay for the lawyer fees. My parents wanted to give me one last day as a family together, giving me the one thing I love most. before they separated to, to divorce the following month. Which is why they wanted to focus entirely on me and not each other. It was also all I could bear to do. I grew up and remained in love with amusement parks, and I find great, and I find great joy in their manufactured happiness, rose-tinted, ersatz version of the world. While the magical castle is fake, the emotions are not. 
that some of my happiest moments alive have been within their perfectly guarded grounds, diligently cataloging, cataloging the memories of these days, because I know these moments are as ephemeral as a youthful Midwestern August night. I'd learned that Indiana Beach, my parents' mysterious theme park, closed this summer due to COVID. And I felt a despairing pain in my chest, not just for the loss of one of my beloved theme parks, but for the temporary reprieve of heartache of some kid who doesn't get to spend the day with their family, consumed by the joy of the phosphorescent skyline. I am, I am grateful for my mother for giving me this memory. She hoped I would never forget, and I have not. All right, give it up for Jonathan Hammond, everybody. Our next storyteller came on to the So Say We All Seen like a rocket, and she's been performing great stories ever since. Welcome, Victoria Leva. Yeah. At 11 a.m., the hunt would begin at Heritage Park in East Chula Vista. We waited in nervous anticipation, and when the clock struck, my brother's team dashed to the car and sped off. My team stood by my car and scanned over the scavenger hunt list, planning. This would take strategy. Wait, there's something we can do now, Michael said. He jogged over to a woman who was struggling to carry a crate of food to a park table and helped her. She thanked him and walked back to her car. I spotted task number 53, gag and bind a stranger in the trunk of your car. <laughs> Five points. I turned to her and flashed a smile to appear as non-threatening as possible. Michael walked towards her and asked, Hey, ma'am, can I ask you a huge favor? Can I, uh, gag and bind you and put you in this car trunk? Before I knew it, she climbed into my trunk while laughing <laughs> maniacally. We handed her a ratty t-shirt that was in my trunk, and she stuffed part of it into her mouth without even asking. We had unknowingly picked the most willing woman in a mile-wide radius. <laughs> I snapped the picture of the woman while trying to contain my laughter. The nerves of the beginning of the race subsided each time my stomach shook. Her muffled laughter continued as we pulled her out of the trunk, and she hugged us all before running off. Pulling out of the parking lot high on excitement and too much caffeine, we were determined to win. I tried my best to navigate the suburban humdrum of living in Chula Vista and attending high school. It was boring. Besides the fact I had generalized anxiety disorder, there wasn't much excitement in my life. There was little to do and even less to see where I lived. So, my brother and I decided to make our own fun. A kind of final hurrah before I graduated high school and moved two hours away to attend university. Thoughts of moving away from my friends and family left my stomach in knots and a cold sweat to form, but I was determined to do it. I wanted to spend time with my brother, my closest companion. So, and so, we decided to push our limits and come up with a scavenger hunt. We grew up riding motorcycles together, being wrestling partners, and perpetual shit talkers, so we decided to up the ante and introduce a new game into the mix. There were few rules and even fewer inhibitions when we created the massive list. The rules included that teams could only be five people, there was one car per team, we couldn't split up, and we had to document each task. We drew inspiration from watching Jackass and our unruly and sickly imaginations. It was a gargantuan list of 97 tasks, ranging from shitting in a hat to wearing chicken pot pie shoes. <laughs> to do these tasks, you either had to be dumb or tough. Each task would range from one to five points. My team consisted of my strange and willing high school friends, Kelly, Drake, Ethan, or also including my older cousin, Michael. Task number 17, play Chubby Bunny. Two points. In the parking lot of Suburban Ralph's, Michael opened up a bag of marshmallows. As my older cousin, whom I looked up to for most of my life, I knew that he'd be the key player to help us clinch the win. I always thought he was the coolest person in my family, and I would echo his language and mannerisms. Each of us then took up a single marshmallow, toasted to one another, and proceeded to fill our mouths with the sickly, sugary puffs. In the game Chubby Bunny, the goal is to stuff enough sugary crap in your mouth while being able to coherently say the words, Chubby Bunny. <laughs> Who was it for? Who knows? We only knew it was an easy task to tackle that was on the list. Chubby Bunny, we said. <laughs> Similar to a cult-like incantation, we chanted Chubby Bunny while slowly filling our mouths, mouths to the brim with the confectionery treat. Chubby Bunny! <laughs> Chubby Bunny! <coughs> I shoved my ninth marshmallow into my mouth, and a tip of it touched my uvula, making me gag and spew the candies out of my mouth like Old Faithful onto the black asphalt next to someone's car. With my eyes watering, I picked up the camera and snapped a picture of Drake and Michael vying for the camera. Task number 42, eat a stick of butter. Six points. We stood in a circle and looked at each other. 
It's worth six points, I said. It's a rare task worth six. Everything else only goes up to five. Someone needs to do it. We all looked at each other. With a delicate stomach and a fear of vomiting, I bowed out. Clinging to the Nikon camera in my hands, I felt shame and knew that no one would do the task. Michael lifted up the paper up to see another task, and Drake walked away in silence and disappeared into the store. Figuring that he went to the bathroom, we continued on our list. With a small disposable toothbrush in hand, Ethan approached the payphone. Task number nine, look an earpiece of a telephone. Four points. <laughs> he slipped on his sunglasses and ran his tongue over his braces in anticipation. He reached out and grabbed the phone handle, brought it to his face, and languidly licked the bulbous black speaker. <laughs> he dropped it and then bolted from the phone. <clears throat> he yelled while ripping up the package of the toothbrush, where he then went on to scrub his mouth furiously while we all cackled. A strange combination of disgust and admiration filled me. I then knew that Ethan was, in fact, down as fuck, <laughs> which was the teenage equivalent of earning a medal in battle. Crossing off the task and pen, Drake approached the group. He held in his hand a small box with the word challenge, emblazoned on the front. He took a deep breath, opened the box, and unwrapped the stick of pale butter. Posing for the camera, he said, I chose challenge butter, because this is going to be a challenge in itself. <laughs> he then bit into the small rectangle of fat with the face of a knees. Swallowing the first bite, he shook his shoulders and continued to eat into the bar, savoring it while it slid down his throat. Why the fuck am I doing this? He yelled. Do it. Do it. Do it. We chanted. I turned and ran as he began to gag. My metaphobia in full panic mode while I shuffled away quickly in my flip-flops. By the time I looked around the corner from my group, watching in dismay and quiet admiration, he was done. He would feel nauseous for the rest of the day, only to be relieved when he vomited from doing the cinnamon challenge in our guest bathroom. Task number 63. Four points. The sound of the pen striking through the task on paper was toe-curling. We continued to terrorize the storefront with our antics. Michael smoked an entire pack of cigarettes and smoked one up his nose. Task 73 and 74. Both tasks combined sent just eight points. We squeezed into my small sedan and launched out of the parking lot on the hunt for more tasks. There wasn't a prize to reach at the end of the day. It simply boiled down to sibling rivalry between my brother and I. We had grown up close and would terrorize the neighborhood we grew up in together. We were so often teamed up that it was refreshing to be pitted against one another, surrounded by our friends cheering us on. Listening to a haphazard mix of oldies, No Doubt, and Biz Marquis, we drove around Chula Vista, marking off of the tasks of our list one by one. Tasks flew by quickly as the songs. We laughed and chuckled with the windows down while making plans for our next moves and not letting our sacred sheets fly out of our hands by the wind rushing through the car. Thoughts of my neurosis and anxiety didn't have a place in my mind. For a rare afternoon, I was living in the moment without the what-ifs plaguing me. We went through stores and laughed and joked around while searching for our next tasks. We dogpiled in aisles, got sandwiched between strangers, lick a cactus, toppled into a single shopping cart, posed in a bathtub together, and had all male teammates get their makeup done. And slowly the points trickled in. Task number 32, have an old man rap to an audience. Three points. We spotted him near the bedroom section, bored out of his mind. His glasses were smudged, and he was cleaning them with a tie when we approached him to help, for him to help complete our task. He was born ready. With his vest unbuttoned and his burgundy tie swaying, we listened while he freestyle rapped to the likes of the Sugar Hill Gang. We clapped along and laughed while his words rattled off. When he finished... We cheered and then ran out of the Jerome's furniture store, dodging tables and couches while we struck off another task. Task number nine, go through a car wash. Shirt off, five points. I want to do it, Michael yelled. He pointed to the car wash nestled behind the gas station across from the Jerome's. Speeding across the street, we pulled into the car wash and paid the fee. We shut the doors and watched as my brave cousin tore off his shirt and hopped onto the hood of my car. Struggling to stay situated on the gray metal, he kept sliding down until he suction cupped his chest to the window and waited. I slowly drove beneath the pulsing water jets. Ah! He began to speak in tongues while the ice cold water riddled his back. We screamed in delight while the soap shot into the windows and the massive bristled brush swept my cousin up and down. He screamed while tears poured down our faces before the final rinse. When the water finally relented, he ran out into the sun and shook while I tossed a towel at him. Okay, it's your turn now, he said while pointing a finger at me. Task number 13. 
Tongue the hole of a bowling ball. Five points. Oh. <sighs> okay, this is me. Oh. I can do this. This is whatever. The dormant anxiety rising up again and tightening my throat. <laughs> we pulled into the busy Brunswick's parking lot where I haphazardly pulled into a spot. We walked inside and my hands felt clammy. Busy for a Saturday afternoon. I surveyed the bowling balls. A six pound ball? Too small to tongue, I thought. <laughs> Ooh, that's something I never want to say out loud. <laughs> the bubblegum pink ball? Too bubbly. Then I saw it. It was hefty at 16 pounds, a dulled blue swirl pattern punctuated by four large holes that were designed for sausage fingers. I picked it up and felt its weight. Handing off the camera to my cousin, I used both hands to lift the orb to my face. Ugh, can't believe I'm gonna fucking do this. Well, here we go. I stuck my tongue into the salty, dank hole. Ah, oh. oh, wait, it's not focusing! Michael held the camera up to his eye. Just do it! I hissed. They laughed while the light of the camera flashed on my face and refused to snap a picture. Ah! I held my tongue in the warm hole for what like, felt like an eternity before the final click of the camera went off. Do you want some mouthwash? Kelly asked. Nah, I'm okay. I would soon learn that was a grave mistake. Starting that night, I would be doubled over for five days with a stomach flu. <laughs> Nevertheless, we peeled out of the parking lot and onto the street where the time was beginning to tick a little faster. Day began to fade into night. We only had a small amount of time left. We began to combine our tasks. Having to solicit the help of strangers was a difficult task while searching a shopping center. The mother with her two children? Of course not. The dad with the sports wrap sunglasses and confederate shirt? Run the other fucking way. The white guy with dreads? beaded jewelry, and walking barefoot in the parking lot? His name was Alfredo. <laughs> he slow danced with me for task number four, two points. He poked Kelly in the belly button for at least three seconds for task number eight, two points. He grabbed Michael's crotch for task number 19 for three points, and then finished off strongly by giving Drake a back massage, shirt off, face down on the floor for a measly four points. <laughs> My stomach ached from laughing all day. A wild smile plastered my face, and I felt so accomplished after a day of doing pure shenanigans. Driving home with my team excitedly talking, I realized how my time with some of my favorite people was winding down. I would soon leave my friends and family to go to school, where I would eventually end up having new friends and adventures. I knew that I had experiences coming my way, and for that I was excited, but as we pulled into the parking spot in front of my parents' house, I felt a small sense of longing for what the day was. The break from anxiety, the recklessness of being a teenager, being around the people I loved, I already missed it. Before we knew it, we were exhausted and the day had come to a close. We assembled there, all ten of us. My brother's team was as happy yet haggard looking as we were. We both pulled up our lists and began to count. 28, 71, 134, 174 points. There was a tie. After a day of exhausting our bodies, gas tanks, and psyches, we fucking tied. The news was so upsetting, I began to feel sick to my stomach. Or maybe that was the bowling ball. <laughs> As suspected, I would feel nostalgia for these moments when I was lonely and away from the people I loved most. I would think of them in tough times and remember when the worst thing I could do was tongue a bowling ball. Okay, maybe I could have gone without stomach flu, but hey, if you're gonna be dumb, you gotta be tough. That was Victoria Leva, everybody, with a story that made me super, super happy. I decided to eat supermarket sushi before tonight's vamp. Our next performer is not only a great writer, but also serves on the board of So Say We All, keeping our mighty little boat ashore and the waves of chaos. Please give it up for Loop Dumas, everybody. I was sitting cross-legged on the carpet of Mrs. Ozakai's fourth grade classroom when my life changed in a way I did not yet understand. It was 6.30 a.m., a full hour before the start of the school day. Any other morning, I would still be at home, but we had just finished a section on Native Americans and social studies, so naturally we had been forced to attend an overnight campout on the schoolyard lawn. They woke us at 6 a.m. to get ready for another day of school. My classmates, however, had more immediate concerns. Mrs. O, Mrs. O, can we use your TV? Please, we can't miss it. I was just tagging along, not wanting to be left out, but my classmates had an air of almost religious devotion about them as they settled on the carpet around me, facing the TV Mrs. O wheeled out in front of us. The chatter died off and their eyes snapped to the screen the moment they heard the iconic electronic drum beat and a purple-tailed creature 
like a human mixed with a sort of amphibian cat, soared across a multi-hued cosmos. I want to be the very best, like no one ever was. <laughs> On the screen, a cartoon boy with spiky hair gazed up into the bright lights of the arena. A red and white orb spun through the air, opening to zap a leafy dinosaur into its open maw. To catch them is my real test. To train them is my cause. <laughs> I was about to watch my first episode of Pokemon. For those who didn't grow up in the late 90s, Pokemon is a Japanese video and card game in which children embark on a journey to capture super-powered, often animal-like creatures, Pokemon, and train them to battle on their behalf to earn badges and win the Pokemon League. What seems now like a kind of magical dogfighting ring was, at the time, both a phenomenon and a complex social structure for the elementary school set. Your tribe was determined by whether you played Pokemon Red or Blue. Your social currency measured in the number of rare holographic trading cards in your collection. Gotta catch em all was the franchise's famous tagline, and it was no joke. I had been well and truly caught. Within a few months, I had amassed hundreds of cards, arranged neatly in sheets of plastic inserts that filled a three-ring binder. Pokemon p posters plastered my bedroom walls, my drawers spilled over with its branded apparel, and I woke up early each morning to watch the show before school. The franchise was everything to me, even as it started to become uncool. While my classmates moved on to the next big thing, I carved out a life for myself in the Kanto region. That colorful cartoon world where young people had control over their own destinies and lifelong friends who would fight for them, no matter the threat. The bad guys in Pokemon are Team Rocket, a criminal organization hell-bent on stealing and exploiting Pokemon for financial gain. In the TV show, Team Rocket is represented by Jesse, James, and their talking Meowth, a trio of greedy and incompetent crooks whose harebrained schemes are no match for Ash Ketchum and friends. The end of every episode sees Team Rocket, their evil plot gone to seed, flung out into space in some new and comic way, struck by Pikachu's electric shock or battered by a herd of stampeding Taurus, their retreating bodies shrinking into a sparkling pinprick in the sky. If there was anything about Pokemon I could do with less of, it was Team Rocket. They were not so much a threat as a nuisance, monotonous in their insistence on showing up just when things were starting to get interesting. Anyway, I didn't buy them as villains. In real life, bad guys weren't a bunch of bumbling idiots with bubblegum colored hair and branded uniforms. They were good at hurting people, and they knew how to get away with it. My stepdad was the kind of person only a child could fear. Although athletic, John was a slip of a man at five foot four, counting the lifts he wore in his shoes. By day, he sold audio equipment from his home office. By night, he donned leather pants and played guitar in a so-called rock band, whose club gigs included covers of Turn the Beat Around and Holiday. In mixed company, he would laugh and joke and brag about my academic achievements. In private, he was more likely to tell me that good grades weren't worth shit, that I might get A's at school, but I got F's at home. He was a different person behind closed doors, at least toward me. His jaw was set in an unbreakable grimace. He ruled the house with a militaristic rigor, flying off the handle if a glass of water sat on the counter for more than a few minutes, or even the faintest sound could be heard from my Game Boy Pocket. I had gotten it for Christmas, neon green, transparent, with my own copy of Pokemon Blue. I played for hours on end, so long that my eyes bugged out and began to twitch. John hated the amount of time I devoted to the game, often reminding me that when he was a child growing up in Guam, his father would beat him if he sat around the house like that. His words dripped with disdain for the permissiveness of American society and the limits it set on the correction of children and their bodies. As John liked to point out, I had never been a skinny kid. Fat wasn't a word my mother liked. She preferred husky and insisted that one day I'd have a growth spurt and all my baby weight would just fall away. She didn't worry about how much I ate, as long as my meals were balanced. My mom was the queen of, there's more on the stove, so second helpings were common, if not compulsory. It's the Italian mother in me, now manja. As long as I ate the salad she served with every meal, she was happy to love me the way I was. 
she didn't seem to notice the way John looked at me. How, although he didn't say a word in her presence, the sight of me eating twisted his face in revulsion. When it was just the two of us at home, he was more forthcoming with his contempt. What are you eating? He'd say, appearing suddenly behind me as I grabbed a string cheese out of the fridge. His office was a few steps off the kitchen. He could hear every time the refrigerator door opened. Are you even hungry? Yes. You're not hungry. You're greedy. That's why you're so fat. If you're hungry, drink water. He didn't like when I ate lunch either, because three meals a day were too many for a slob like me. John took pride in eating only once a day, usually his preferred dish of spam and rice with lashings of Tabasco. I felt his eyes watching me from across the dinner table, looking to see how much I'd consumed, narrowing with disgust if I didn't openly reject the second helpings my mom was already heaping on my plate. In a house where food was love, but eating was shameful, Family meals were both a relief and a curse, a volatile push and pull of comfort and fear. By the second grade, I had found a solution, eat in secret. I would stick my head into the kitchen, make sure no one was there, and try not to make a sound as I turned the handle on the pantry door, stand there in the darkness of the pantry, scarfing down as much as I could, as fast as I could, shove it down by the fistful, Fig Newtons, Cheez-Its, slices of plain bread, Feel it collect at the top of my gut, that almost uncomfortable fullness radiating a sensation of soothing calm through my body, like a hug. Find a way to do it again and again and again. I told my mom about the things John would call me, lazy, fat boy, pig, and she would confront him, sometimes aggressively. Invariably, he would admit some minor wrongdoing and convince her it would never happen again. At best, he might lay off me for a couple of days. The day she came into my room, sat down on my bed, and told me that she and John had eloped while I was away for the weekend, I burst into tears. My mom looked aghast. What's wrong, Lukey? What's the matter? Her eyes were wide. I thought things were getting better. Fortunately, I spent every other weekend at my dad's house in Point Loma. Dad didn't keep much food in the house, so when I came over, the first thing he'd do was take me to Stumps and let me pick out whatever I wanted. Bagels, tortilla chips, cookies. Even better, I could play my Game Boy in peace, disappear into the streets of Saffron City, and battle gym leader Sabrina for the Marsh Badge. Pidgeotto used sand attack. Venomoth's accuracy fell. Venomoth used leech life. It's not very effective. One time my dad went out, leaving me home alone with the cupboards fully stocked. I was in the kitchen devouring Oreos straight out of the package when suddenly I heard the garage door open below me. Dad was coming up the stairs, which led straight into the kitchen. There was no time to hide the evidence. Panicking, I stepped into the pantry and pulled the doors shut. Dad entered the kitchen and called out for me. When I didn't answer, he searched the house, hollering my name as he went from room to room. Finally, he came back into the kitchen, his footsteps hurried. I could see his feet encased in flip-flops on the beige linoleum through the slats in the pantry door. He was shouting now, in one of his rages, or close to it, Where the fuck are you? I'm not fucking around! I must have made a noise, for a second later, he ripped open the pantry doors to find me standing there, the half-eaten package of Oreos clutched in my hands. I'm sorry. Please don't be mad. Please don't be mad at me. What do you do? I ate them. I'm sorry. Please don't be mad. Once he'd calmed down a bit, my dad called my mother, demanding to know what the fuck was going on in that house. Demanding to know why his kid was so terrified to be caught eating in his own home. You tell that motherfucker that if he calls my kid a fat pig again, I'm going to kick his motherfucking ass. I was happy to hear it. Finally, someone was doing something. Back then, I thought he meant it. Every Pokemon has a type, which reflects their natural habitat and what special attacks they can perform. Electric, fire, grass, rock, there are dozens of them, each with their own strengths and vulnerabilities. Like the character Misty from the cartoon, water-type Pokemon were my specialty. A true San Diegan, I had grown up in the water. My dad was a surfer, so every Saturdays were spent at Tourmaline Beach. While we went, while he went out on his longboard, I would wait out and wade out into the water until the tide was up to my chest. One day, as I jumped around in the waves, I imagined two of my favorite water types, Staryu and Goldeen, were there with me. 
Happy to be out of their Pokeballs, they showed off their agility in the water, nourished by the sea, like I was. Another boy and his younger sister appeared beside me. The little girl looked at me. Why do you have your shirt still on? Her eyes scanned me up and down. My wet Pokemon tee clung to the rolls of my fat. I pulled it away from my chest and it filled with air like a balloon, hiding the lines of my body in a way that felt safer. I don't like taking it off. Why? She persisted. Boys are supposed to take off their shirts. I shrugged. Well, she said. Her brother leapt over a wave. Because he's fat, Kayla. Without even looking, I could feel Staryu and Goldeen surface beside me. Could feel them quivering with anger, waiting for my command. Do it, Staryu, I thought. Use your water gun. Staryu leapt into the air, taking aim at the brother and sister and blasting them with a jet of water. Great job. Now, Goldeen, show them your horn attack. Goldeen skated over the waves, her frilly orange and white tail fin dancing behind her, lowering her horned head as she picked up speed. Kabam! Goldeen used horn attack. Critical hit. Come on, let's go. The boy pulled his sister away by the wrist, leaving us in peace. I grinned. In November 1999, to coincide with the theatrical release of Pokemon the first movie, Burger King launched a promotion that in time would go down in infamy as the one that ended in the death of two children and a national recall. But to me, it was simply the greatest thing to happen to the kids' meal, since the big kids' meal. For two months, every big BK kids' meal included one of 57 collectible Pokemon, each encapsulated in a plastic Pokeball. That winter break, as often as I could convince my mother to part with five dollars, I walked to the Burger King on Poway Road and added another battle partner to my collection. One day I scored big with a Jigglypuff, a pink sphere with tiny hands and an Elvis-style quaff. Coming home from Burger King with my new friend, I went into the kitchen. John had been away when I left. Assuming he was still out, I opened the fridge, more out of habit than anything else. Suddenly a voice spoke from behind the refrigerator door. Eating again. My body went cold. I slammed the refrigerator door shut. No, I wasn't. That's why you're getting fatter and fatter, John said, because you're always eating. I'm not always eating. Even as I said it, I knew it was a lie. I tried not to let the shame show on my face. Look at you. You're disgusting. You think you're clever sneaking food? You think I don't notice? But I know everything you eat, fat pig. Don't call me that, I said, my eyes stinging. Or what, you're going to tell your mom I was mean to you, fat pig? I'm not a fat pig. I was so angry, I threw my Jigglypuff down on the floor like a challenge. Jigglypuff, I choose you. Of course you are. Look at you, you fat fuck. John used poison sting. It was super effective. Luke was hurt by poison. Tears slid down my cheeks. Why wouldn't he just leave me alone? I wish Jigglypuff would jump off, off the floor and launch herself in John's direction. Feet planted, fist, fists raised, a cartoon vein popping out of her forehead. I wish she were real. I wish they all were. Blastoise and Gengar and Golbat. Just like I wish my dad's threats had been real. And my mom's promises that John wouldn't do this anymore that things would be better. But none of them were. I had no one to fight for me, except for me. Luke used focus energy. Luke is getting pumped. Luke looked at John and told him to go fuck himself. <laughs> the summer after fifth grade, my mom left John, taking me and my younger siblings with her. He remained in the house in Poway while we moved into a two-bedroom apartment at the edge of town. Although it was a downgrade in lifestyle, my home life improved dramatically. When I got home from school, I had the place to myself for a good hour. I could do and eat whatever I wanted, as much as I wanted. As much as it took to dampen the feelings of shame and self-loathing, I had taken away from that house like an illness. My mom apologized again and again for having kept me, all of us, in John's care as long as she had. I tried not to blame her. She was a good mom and had always tried to do what was best, even if she didn't always know what that was. That Christmas, Mom upgraded my Game Boy Pocket to a Game Boy Color and my old Pokemon Blue to the new Silver. I played through it, but it wasn't quite the same. The story was familiar, but the Pokemon were different, pale imitations of the original 150. 
The whole world seemed to have lost its magic. Or maybe I just didn't need it anymore. In time, I would give it all up, bequeathing my game, my card collection, all of it to my little brother. Perhaps one day he too would learn to fight for himself. But until then, he'd have Pokemon. everybody that was vamp amuse me theme parks and games thank you so much for joining us we hope you enjoyed the showcase we are so glad that you were here with us chatting with us and each other and we look forward to seeing you at the next vamp which is august plan b please don't forget to donate uh, we have the link here in the description of the showcase Thank you again so much, and we will see you soon. We definitely want your story. Remember, it's Sunday midnight deadline for Plan B. If you need a little bit more time, email us. Uh, we won't mind too hard. Also, see you at Long Story Short next week. We miss your faces. And uh, as we sign off from this live show, one of our performers in this cohort who could not join us live at the show here uh, sent it in digitally. And so here is your final performer of the evening, Holland Halser. Holland Kelly. Oh, Holland Kelly. Right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>
By noon, I've managed to get everyone's RSVP, five girls all in, and count, counting Whitney. Her enthusiasm about attending is lacking. Big sighs, like she's exhausted by the thought of my existence, but at least I'll feel like I do exist. She'll see what she's been missing out on. I spend hours preparing my room, a buffet of 3D Doritos, both nacho cheese and Cool Ranch, because who wants to be responsible for that decision? A wide assortment of candy from Butterfinger BBs to Sour Straws, Sobe, and an ample amount of Totino's Pizza Bites. All set for the ultimate chill sesh. Beanbag chairs, a black light, a ceiling covered in glow-in-the-dark stars, and a Ouija board. Will we raise the dead? Who knows? But the spirit of fun will be alive and well. We're going to cap off the night by watching Scream. I'm always the one that suggests we watch a slasher movie, but I'm also the one that doesn't fall asleep because I'm too scared. But there's a special bond in being terrified together, like we've survived something. By Monday, we'll have so many inside jokes. Five o'clock hits, my guests arrive. Everyone seems sincerely excited to be attending. The next few hours consist of devouring junk food, gossiping, prank calling, and shaking a magic eight ball until we get the answers we want. Even Whitney seems to be enjoying herself. I'm not confident about what self-confidence feels like, but I would bathe in whatever this feeling is. The mood gradually changes from silly to spiritual. When we assemble around the Ouija board and take turns asking whether or not our crush is like us, you know, things that ghosts just wait around to answer. The plastic indicator is caked in artificial cheese from the Doritos we ate, but no one cares. The spirits are speaking. That's something serious. Whitney's become unamused. She gets up, grabs my notebook off my desk, begins ripping up small pieces of paper and chucks some pins at us. Okay, new game. All eyes are on her now. We'll write one thing we like about each other and one thing we don't like. Come on, it'll be fun and it's anonymous, so we're not gonna get mad at each other. Don't you wanna know what your friends really think about you? Let's do it. This is definitely one of those moments where someone should intervene, like a, if you see something, say something situation, but it's clear that none of us are going to speak up. So we began writing. I'm trying my best to keep it positive, even the negative things. Julie's smile is too pretty. Catherine's too smart. All the names are tossed in an empty chips bowl. I have the worst kind of butterflies, not even butterflies, pens and needles poking their way throughout my gut. Whitney's taken it upon herself to read all of them, pausing dramatically before saying our names, reading the compliment or insult, and staring at the subject like a pastor, making sure they really drive the message home during their sermon. Catherine, sometimes you wear too much body splash. And then a long gaze at Catherine, indicating, let that set in, Catherine. Reconsider your choice of fragrance and get a handle on your sprays. Finally, my name gets pulled. Holland makes me laugh. I make people laugh? I'll take it. I breathe a sigh of relief and let the serotonin saturate until my name gets pulled again. Whitney looks at me with a smug grin. Holland, she reads it to herself and lets out a small laugh. Okay, so I don't know who thinks this, but it says that they don't like that you wear tight clothes. She looks at me with condescending pity. I'm brimming with rage, heartache, and a cocktail of shame and disappointment and disgust. Not disgust over what they said about me, disgust about my body. Yes, some of my clothes are tight. It's not news to me. It's not that I think they look great, but as a sophomore in high school, I haven't wanted to commit to wearing moo-moos exclusively. Forgive me for wearing clothing that alludes to the shape of my body. Who would write that? For 10th graders, they have remarkable poker faces. The inside of my nose is burning. I'm trying to hold in snot and tears. What hurts the most is that my body bothers people. And it's not a quick fix. This is 15 years of Happy Meals. I pull at the edges of my oversized nightshirt. Is it loose enough? Is this moment going to be part of the Monday morning highlight reel? But the issue of my ill-fitting wardrobe is suddenly upstaged. Catherine, a usually fairly quiet girl, speaks up. 
Whitney, you haven't read any of yours yet. Saving the best for last. Whitney unfolds the papers and begins reading. Okay, aw, this one's nice. Someone said I have the best style. Aw, thanks guys. Okay, let's see what's next. She glances up from the paper. The look in her eyes gives me chills. If we were standing next to each other near a cliff, I would flee. Whitney thinks she's better than everyone. Acts like a spoiled brat. She tears the papers into shreds, destroying the evidence that someone doesn't view her approval as a necessity for 10th grade survival. Who wrote that? Admit it. Don't be a coward. Say it to my face, you bitches. Catherine hops up from her beanbag chair, which is really an accomplishment in itself because usually you have to roll off of those things. She's not only brave, but extremely agile. I wrote it. Whitney inched closer to Catherine. I inched further back. What did you say? Catherine had evolved from a meek girl that hid behind glasses and bangs to a total badass. I wrote it. And it's true. Everyone knows it. You get what you want when you want it because people are scared of you. I'm sick of going along with your bullshit. Whitney's hand slaps the side of Catherine's face with such force that she can't finish speaking. How dare you? Whitney shows zero remorse as her handprint is quickly darkening on Catherine's face. We huddle around Catherine. We're not going to let her get struck again. Whitney's crying. Great. Now everyone is like mad at me and like hates me or whatever. She was a good snob. She's an even better victim. This is actually happening and it's happening at my house, in my room. I can feel the power dynamic shifting. I get to kick her out. Surely everyone agrees with me now. They can't argue with Whitney's handprint on Catherine's cheek. I hand her the phone to call her mom, but Catherine takes it away. I want to rip it out of Catherine's hands and throw it back at Whitney. Catherine's voice is sympathetic, something that Whitney doesn't deserve. We don't hate you. Inside, I am shouting, speak for yourself, Catherine. I hate her. I hate her so much. And we now have this prime opportunity to kick her out, but instead we're just going to wipe the slate clean. Whitney gets to go around slapping people and then be comforted about it. I keep those thoughts to myself. This argument is dissolving faster than the handprint on Catherine's cheek. The rest of us stand there watching them embrace like long lost sisters. Sometimes you make it hard to like you, that's all. The other girls continue to comfort Whitney. This is my house, my room but Whitney has still managed to take ownership of it, if even just for the night. The girls roll out their sleeping bags. I pop scream in the VCR and join them. Watching a mass murderer attack people when they're home alone is a nice distraction from the horror that is friendship among teenage girls. Great job, everybody. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Ooh.